or just look at everybody. <laughs> this is Carver, and this is Kylie Ann, and this is my beautiful wife, Patty, or Patricia. <laughs> And I, I said to Carver, I said, are you excited for your first day at the church? And he said, no, this is our second, because we were here incognito one week. So uh, they already feel like they're part of the family. So <laughs> well, thanks, guys. You can sit down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Mother's Day is a, it's a wonderful time of celebration, of rejoicing and what. God has gifted us in our moms, but it's also a time of sadness for some. For many, it's a time of despair and suffering because of life and what happens in life. And back in 2005, my first child was, was, was stillborn on her due date. A child that we anticipated with great joy, uh, we look forward to. And on the day that she was supposed to come into the world, she exited this world. It was a terrible, terrible day in July. And that first Mother's Day as pastor, it was a terrible, terrible day. It wasn't a day of excitement. It was a day of sadness. The day we went to the grave instead of went out to lunch. And that was what our first time was. And I remember talking to my wife and all those emotions and experiences. She, she knew in her heart she was a mom. She knew that God created her to be a mom, but we didn't have the child to prove it. Some of you out there today, you know what I'm talking about because you've, you've had a loss or multiple losses. You've, maybe you've had a miscarriage or a stillbirth. Maybe you've lost a child when they were already in the world, as an adult, as a teenager. And so when you come to Mother's Day, it's not a time of great joy. Maybe it is for the, for the children that you still have and you're blessed with, but it's a time of remembering those who you don't have anymore. So I wanna share with you uh, from my heart, and I'll explain more about what this is, but this is uh, something called a peace bear. My daughter's name was Peace. And so we named her peace because God gave us an immense peace. And so as I go to Mother's Day, there's a lot of things that we do out of tradition because we know the pain of what Mother's Day can be. We also know the joy because we have three little blessings, which you saw. And so for those of you who have had a loss, on this Mother's Day, you're not a used-to-be mother. You are a mother. Does it matter if you have a child sitting next to you, if you have a child in heaven? You're not a used-to-be mother. God knows you. He created you to be a mother. He loves you. And when you, we think about this, you need to know that your babies are known by God fully, completely, and they're known by him. The Bible promises that they will never be forgotten because in Genesis 16:3 it says that God is a God who sees you. He's El Roy, but he also is a God who sees your baby, sees your child. So as we celebrate, remember today that your pain, it's not forgotten. And that pain, if you struggle to have children, if you struggle through fertility, your pain's not forgotten. God knows you. God sees your heart. God's there with you. And he loves you. Psalms 34, 18 says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So today as we celebrate mothers, we celebrate you. We know you. We see you. God sees you. And one of the ways that you can love a mother is just tell them that you, you love them, that you understand. Some of the most important things for us that first Mother's Day was to get Mother's Day cards for my wife. It was important for me because it was recognized that God created her as a mother, even though our child was in heaven. So I want to read this today as we go back into worship. To those who gave birth to a lost child this year, we celebrate you. To those who lost a child this year, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarried, failed adoptions, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes, prods, fears, and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this harder for you. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we celebrate with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of your own mother, we acknowledge your experience. 
to those who live through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better, better for having you in our midst. To those who are single and long to be married and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not turned out the way you long for it to be. To those who step-parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, yet that dream is not to be, we grieve with you. To those who have empty or nest in the upcoming year, we grieve and rejoice with you. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness. Remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart. And we have real warriors in our midst. We remember you. Well, probably the one thing you're wondering this morning is why I have pink shoes on. And I'm going to explain that to you. There's two, there's two reasons. One, last Sunday after church, I was invited uh, to go hang out with this awesome family. And um, <laughs> during that time there, I happened to go home from church, change my clothes, and I slipped a pair of like uh, kind of knockoff Crocs on. And I wore them over the house. I was like, oh, I'll take them off when I get in the house. Pretty easy. So as I was there, somebody mentioned I had Crocs, and somebody was making fun of my Crocs and said, you shouldn't wear Crocs unless you're like five years or younger. <laughs> Adults don't wear Crocs. So I said, I'm going to wear them next Sunday at church. And... Uh, <laughs> but also the reason I have these Crocs on are, are for that reason, but also for me, I try to find as many clothes as I can in the color pink. And that's a very important color to my family. Uh, it helps us to remember our daughter, Peace. Uh, we've actually had two losses. We had a miscarriage and we had a stillborn uh, daughter. And uh, so those were both girls. And so I wear pink, and I have a pink phone, so if you ever want to make fun of my phone, that's okay. It doesn't bother me, but the reason I have a pink phone is every time I look at that phone, it's just a reminder of my children who are in heaven. And so on Mother's Day, I wear pink. Sometimes on Father's Day, I wear pink, and just different times of the year as we try to remember our children who are no longer with us. And when we don't have them every day, these are kind of the important symbolic things that we do. And so that's why, because my shoes are, my feet are really big like boats, they don't make pink shoes for men. So this is as close as I could get. So I apologize, I couldn't find any cooler pink shoes, but these are what I have. <laughs> so that's why the pink. Um, today we're talking about moms, motherhood, and why it is so important. And one of the things about this world, and we, I think John Hawthorne mentioned this morning, there's only two people in the Bible that don't have moms, and uh, that's Adam and Eve, pretty simple, and uh, the, the first two people that were ever created. So all of us have one thing in common. We all have a mom. For good or bad, we all have a mom. And so today we're talking about moms, and we're talking about being monumental. And uh, today's title being monumental. My wife shared this on Facebook yesterday, because I told her to. But uh, all I want for Mother's Day is for my kids to remember they have a father that can also get them a glass of juice. <laughs> this happens in our house quite a bit. And it says, hashtag, don't yell for me when he is standing right there. So also has happened many times. And my wife says, why are you asking me? Your father is right next to you. And uh, it's just, it's the kind of funny things that you have when you have children. I look at him like, yeah, why aren't you asking me? I'll go get it for you. And uh, it's just the difference of connection that a mother has with her children. There is, I'm a father and I recognize it. And I love hanging out with my kids. I love cuddling. I love playing games with them. I just love having life together with them. But there is a different connection that they have with their mother that I will never get to have. And I'm okay with that because I celebrate my wife. I celebrate her as their mother and it's unique and it's special and I'm okay with that. And the Bible has some great mothers that we kind of connect with all through scripture. I have some examples of some great mothers in the Bible. Mary, Jesus' own mother. Uh, it says in Luke 138, and Mary said, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. She, when the angel came to visit her, she just said, I'm in. Okay, God, I'm in. I'm all for it. Let's go. No hesitation. She just knew that this was what was supposed to happen, and she responded out of faithfulness. That's why she's a great example of a faithful mother. Naomi and Ruth. Uh, Ruth loves Naomi so much that she would not part 
from her, from her as a family member. And, and, they, and Naomi was her mother-in-law. So some of you today, you're mothers-in-law, and you understand that you have great relationship with your, uh, your in-law. And that's fine, your daughter-in-law, your son-in-law. That's okay to have those great relationships. Some of you, you struggle for it and you pray for it, and that's okay too as you work to, to having that connection. But in Ruth 1.16, it says, for where you go, this is Ruth speaking, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. One of the awesome parts for me about this is that Naomi was a great example of a loving, but only, not only loving mother, but a faithful follower of God to Ruth. And that was important. Some of you today are grandmothers, and Lois is a great example of a grandmother in Scripture. In 2 Timothy 1.5, it says, I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure dwells in your heart. This is Paul talking to Timothy. But his faith, Timothy, his faith started not with his mother, even though it kind of flowed through her and she was a great influence on him, it started first because his grandmother had great faith and, and followed the Lord. And some of you who are grandmothers, you are an important person, not only in the life of your children and your grandchildren, but in this church because you are what we would call like the progenitors of the faith. You bring this faith and you share it from generation to generation. And it is awesome. You have a place and you are important, not only in this church, but in the kingdom, just like Lois was when the, in the life of Timothy. And I'll just be, I'll be real honest, without my grandmothers who all loved the Lord, I wouldn't be standing here today. My grandmothers were great examples of women who feared the Lord, who loved him and devoted their lives to him. And because of that, I'm standing here as a pastor, uh, rejoicing about what they've meant to me. Some of you have known uh, or experienced adoption or foster care. The Bible in Ephesians 1 talks about how we are predestined by God for adoption as his sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. God is an example of adoption. He brings us into his family. And adoption is a great way for us to show love and for mothers to love someone else, to be a mother. I'm celebrating just this past couple weeks because my family, my extended family, has grown by one. My sister and brother-in-law have gotten custody of a 17-year-old girl. She was being physically abused. Um, the, the state took her away from her father and gave her um, to my sister and her husband. Uh, and they were able to now get permanent custody of her until she's... She'll be 18 and be an adult because he has now gotten 18 months in prison. And so we got to welcome her as her family, and now I'm kind of her uncle. And so uh, she had a hard time with me moving here because she's like, I know I got this really cool uncle, and he's moving away. But she got adopted into our family, and now she has a mother who can love her. Her mother passed away uh, years ago from cancer. So she's never really known what it's like to have a mother. And even at 17, she's getting to experience the joy of having a mother through, through uh, adoption, fostering, through just the custody issue. James 1.27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself uh, unstained from the world. We are given this charge to love people. And mothers are given this charge to take care of not only their children, but to have spiritual impact in the world. We have Mother Teresa, who was a mother to hundreds in her lifetime. And she didn't actually have her own child. She was able to mother and to be a mother. And so mothering is important. It goes all the way back kind of in Scripture to the beginning. And there's a common thread that goes through mothers. They all have these similar roles. Some mothers are, are the CEOs of the family. They're the chief executive officer. They, uh, some moms are single moms. They make every single decision in the home. They're also CFOs, the chief financial officer. And then they're the COO of the home, the chief operating officer. And they're also the chef, the personal shopper, the chauffeur, the executive assistant, the nurse, the maid, the custodian, and the counselor. And dozens, if not hundreds of other jobs, all are typically done many times by one single person. You can't be compensated enough for all these jobs in the world. 
But moms do them and do it because they love their children and they love the Lord. I call this kind of mom a mom who is mom-umental, meaning an exceptionally great mother whose Christ-like qualities and teachings endure forever in the heart and mind of her child. That's what I look to Scripture and see as something that's mom-umental. It's not, they don't need some great monument because for a mom that's monumental, her children are her monument. That's what reflects who she is to the world. And someone even like Mother Teresa, the legacy of her name and the people that her, her ministry changed their lives, that was her monument. That's how you recognize and understand uh, her in that way. And this goes all the way back to me. Motherhood is back from Genesis when Adam and Eve, they messed up and got kind of kicked out of the garden. That was what started the whole process of having moms in the world. And Eve became the first mother. And, and now we have, we go today, that in very early in the Bible in Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we get an idea of how a mom is supposed to act, how she's supposed to behave. And it's, uh, it's what we call now imago Dei in Latin. It's the image of God. See, a mother is supposed to be the image of God to her children. Just like God himself uh, brought Adam and Eve into the world, moms play a super important role in bringing children into the world. Uh, and it's an amazing role. And the imago Dei, when you get into the Hebrew the word actually means like image, shadow, likeness, reflection. A mother is to be a reflection of God to her children in, in all times. And that's how she becomes monumental. So when I look at the biblical role of mothers, uh, the biblical mothers' are, role is to reflect Christ, the imago Dei, to be an image of Christ, an image of God to her children in good times and bad and happy times and sad to be the Imago Dei. What I call is, when I look at God, they call God a 3-0 God, which means God is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. All-powerful, all-knowing, and everywhere. That's God. Now, moms can never do that, but we expect them to have roles that are very broad, much in the same. And so when we're talking today about the biblical role of mothers, uh, I believe, truthfully, that moms are to be momnipresent, momniscient, and momnipotent. Now, they're not supposed to be God to their children, but we are supposed to reflect the image of God, the characteristics, the behavior, the attitude of God to our children. And so that's what moms do. They reflect Christ. And so I've been looking this week at, at at uh, Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31. And it talks about a woman who fears the Lord. And verses 10 through 31, it's an acrostic poem in its original language in Hebrew. And each verse begins with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so even when you read it in English, you kind of lose the meaning of the poem. But when it was written so long ago, it was beautiful. It was this beautiful poem about a woman who fears the Lord. And I want to share with you this morning a couple stories before we get into Scripture about women who feared the Lord. Because last Mother's Day, I got to be part of a miracle. Who here has ever been part of a miracle before? You can raise your hand. Be proud. That's an amazing thing. Uh, what had happened is uh, last Mother's Day, I had, we had two services at my church. And in between the services, we had about 45 minutes. And so during that time, I had planned a time of prayer and reflection for mothers who Mother's Day is not a, a great day. And just that they could have the separate service if they didn't want to come to, to church, because a lot of mothers skip Mother's Day because it's, it's not a fun, exciting day. It's a, it's a terrible day for some. So we kind of planned a service between the services for, for moms who were kind of wanting to just get away, just have somebody pray for them and anoint them. And during that time, I had uh, a friend, uh, who, a couple who are my friends who who have been struggling with fertility. And they went to, through a series, a couple different series of uh, IVF treatments, trying to get pregnant. And on this day of all days, they wanted to talk and they wanted to pray. And so as kind of their friend, I, we took them in my office and we sat down and we prayed. And this is how the conversation started. They, you know, I thought we were praying that God would help them get pregnant. And they sat down and they said, we just want to pray that we'll be okay with not having children. 
we've just decided that we're not going to do a third round of IVF, and we're, we're okay, and we just want God to know we're totally fine never having children. And, and they, so that's what they wanted me to pray for, pray for them not have children. I said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> um, I'm not going to limit God's power uh, because you, that's where you're at. I said, I will, I will not pray for that. I said, what I will pray for is very specific prayers for what you need. Because they actually had a round of, uh, they had a last doctor's appointment the next day, or that next Wednesday. And so I said, let's talk about all of kind of your procedures. So we went down to the size of eggs they needed to have to have to be able to get fertilized and all this stuff. And they gave us this very finite details. And so we prayed a very specific prayer and said, God, we need these to be this millimeter and all this. And I said, I am not going to not let you pray this prayer. Like, I'm not going to be part of it that you just give up because God is so much bigger than that. And so they agreed and, you know, they're like, okay, we'll do it. We'll pray. And so we got uh, another pastor and his wife and, and, we all got together and we prayed. And we prayed a powerful prayer. And we, uh, in just obedience to Scripture, we looked at God's Word and said, this is what we're going to do. So they went to the meeting on Wednesday. Nothing. It, it, was, it was terrible. No, 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 no sign of pregnancy. And so they just, you know, we were hoping for the miracle right then and there. We were like, it's, it's going to happen. We were praying for them all week. We went, had the other pastor went over to their house and prayed the night before. I mean, we just knew that God was going to do something amazing and just be assigned to them. And so uh, we got this text, and we didn't hear from them for a week. Well, a week later, they had to go back for like an extra, you know, I don't know what it was. I haven't been in those meetings. But they went back, and then we got this amazing text. A miracle had happened. In that week of despair, something happened amazing. They, there's no reason they should have got pregnant. The doctors didn't understand it. But I believe why they got pregnant, and now they have this little beautiful boy. His name's Clark. He's now in the world, and this Mother's Day is a great Mother's Day for, for that family, and he's just this wonderful blessing to them. But I believe that what happened is they finally, finally just let it all go, and they gave it all over to God, and God said, I'm bigger and I'm more powerful than all of this, and watch what I can do when you believe. And that doesn't happen every time for everyone, but it was an amazing miracle that I got to participate in in just a small little bit. And then I got to see that little boy come into the world, which was, which was a neat moment. I've also uh, got to just rejoice in that because when, we, when you are a mom who fears the Lord, amazing things happen in the life of your children, your spouse, and you. And you can see the image of God as you reflect it, reflect it back. And it is awesome. And so when we get into Proverbs, it kind of begins in 31, verse 10, begins with kind of this introduction to the poem. It says, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. That's what this, a woman who fears the Lord, she's an amazing woman, an awesome wife. And for many of you, you men especially are sitting here you know, because this person is someone that you know to be your mother, to be your spouse. And for some of you, this is a person that you know to be your child, your daughter, as she's growing up into this amazing woman uh, of God, becoming monumental. And as I look to this, I see uh, in verse 13, it says, she seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. Now, if you just read this, like, well, she works with willing hands, which means uh, she likes, she's okay with working. But what it means when you look at the kind of the Greek translation, that word willingly, it means like the pleasure of her hands. A, a, a woman who fears the Lord, for her love, her love for her children, her love for her spouse, it makes the toil delightful. So when she's exhausted at the end of the day, she's exhausted because she loves like Christ. She's an image of God and the toil is delightful. There's, there's times when my wife is just exhausted at the end of the day. And I know why. You met all three of them. And then the fourth one's right here. Um, so she's just exhausted. She's like, I need to go to sleep. And for me, I don't have to have as much sleep as her. But I'm not delighting as much during the day with the children as she is. But love makes the toil delightful. It's a special relationship that moms get to have with their children. 
And as we look in Proverbs 10, 30, uh, 31, 10 to 31, I'm going to challenge you to read this this week and look at it from a different perspective. Whether you're a woman or whether you're a man, read it and get to know it because it tells you some important truths about not only moms but women and why it's important. So we're going to look at those three different characteristics. The first being omnipresent. Now, what I call this is mom's not going to be everywhere all over the world. That's not what this is. But it's a mom who, for her family, is everywhere all the time. That's that chauffeur. That's that provider, the chef, the person that just takes care of all her needs. And, and I know this as a, as a father. When my wife goes away, you know, I get the job done. But when she comes back, everything is a mess because I am just not... I was not wired to be a mother. And I try hard. You know, I try to get the dishes done and I try to clean up the bed, but I just don't do it with the excellence that she did. Sometimes I just don't do it at all because I am not <laughs> wired to be this loving provider that she is, but she's just momny present. She's just empowered by God to love our family, our children, and me in an amazing way. And I appreciate it so much more when she leaves and I have to do that job for her because I understand. In, fifth, in verse 15, it says, um, she, this woman who fears the Lord, rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. If you're a mom, you know you've risen at night many times before to take care of your children, to love them when they're crying. And if you are married to a husband like me who can sleep through a hurricane, <laughs> you definitely know about rising. Because I just, I wake up in the morning and I get like a rundown of what happened. And she's like, you didn't hear all that? Nope. You didn't hear? Uh, my last house, we had like the toilet was in, like in a little room right next to, the, maybe like four feet from our bed. She's like, you didn't hear that kid throwing up all night long? Didn't hear it at all. And because she's a loving provider, she could have just jabbed me with her elbow enough times to wake me up, but she didn't because she's mom depressed. She's a mom who loves her children and she reflects God in an amazing and powerful way. In 18, it says, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. Mom is always ready, always ready. I know when my kids come down, I have a child, my son, I actually woke up last night. He came to at four o'clock in the morning to go to the bathroom. We heard him. Actually, I heard him first, and I heard him creeping down our, our creaky little steps at our new house. And uh, so I was like, well, who's that? And, uh, you know, it's just that, that feeling. But I know if I had a child cry, my wife would have been out of bed like that. Um, she obviously knew somehow with her mom present sense that he was okay and he was fine because she didn't get up. But she just, that's kind of how a mom is. They just have this way of being connected to their children in a unique and, and amazing way, and always are ready in anticipation of when they're needed. Now, uh, verse 25 says, strength and dignity are her closing, and she laughs at the time to come. A mom who is omnipresent enjoys her children. She loves being a mother. She loves to rejoice with them. She loves to um, see how they grow and how they learn, how they flourish, even when they're young to when they're old and they're older and they become mothers of their own. You get to rejoice watching them have their own children. Um, a loving provider laughs and enjoys uh, being a mother. 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. I don't know too many bombs who are not busy, at least in the realm that I, that I run. That, that, you know, I know that moms are just busy, busy, busy all the time. It's kind of like one of those things that makes you a mom. You're going here and you're going there. You're taking care of food. You're taking care of clothes. You're taking care of baths. And sometimes moms are so busy being a loving provider that they forget to take care of themselves. And as the rest of us, as the church, we need to ensure that mothers are taken care of because they have an important role of being a loving provider for the future of the church. And the way that we can support them, the way that we can help them is to make sure that they um, are loved and supported so that they can continue being the Imago Dei, the reflection of Christ to their children and growing another generation. Uh, the next is momniscient. Moms who are momniscient are wise and knowledgeable. Uh, they're, they're moms that just kind of have this extra mom sense. Uh, they call it, uh, some people call it 
mother's intuition. And, you know, I call it creepy, but uh, some people call it mother's intuition, where moms just know. Uh, I would have times where I was a kid, and my mom would just know. If I was telling a lie, she would just know. And uh, she would just have this understanding that I was lying to her about something. You know, usually I hit my brother, and I wasn't going to fess up to it. But they just know. And so when you look in Scripture and Proverbs, it talks about this woman of fear's Lord and says, she considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. Now, you may think, well, these moms are really busy working in the fields. And they were because that's how they provided for their families. But what's important as we look in these verses, a mom who considers a field has to use wisdom and knowledge to understand how to not only purchase the field, but to take care of the field, how to be able to uh, navigate all that she needs to be able to grow crops in that field. And so there's much more than just having uh, a field and buying it. She has to investigate the soil, the rainfall. It's, it's so much more. And so moms back then, that was a normal part of life, was having a job and having a family. Many of you experience this, that you work a job and you have children at home, and so you know that there's so much more that goes into being a mother because not only do you have, uh, you work 20, 30, 40, 50 hours a week, but then you come home and you do the same at home. And so a mom who is omniscient is wise and knowledgeable, and she's able to balance herself. She's able to be in the world and do business, but also be in the home and be a mom who's omnipresent. Verse 18 says, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. She continues to use knowledge and her wisdom to understand that what she has, has a purpose. It's able to provide for the family. She uses more than just her hands to stay busy taking care of her children. She uses her brain to navigate life in the home and outside the home, to provide for her home, to provide for her family. 26 says she opens her mouth with wisdom and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. A child's first teacher is his mother. That's the first person who begins to teach their children. And, and they are, we should revere mothers because many of, of you came to faith because of your mother, because she loved you, because she loved the Lord, you saw it in her, she told you about it. Maybe for some of you that might be your grandmother. Still the very same role. Uh, grand, many grandmothers raise their children now. And their first, a child's first teacher is their grandmother, who is in that role of, of mother. See, moms who are omniscient use the wisdom they gain from Scripture, through reading God's Word, through their relationship with Him, to teach their children. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go, so that when he's old, he will not turn from it. That's what moms do, and dads do too. But the first teacher is the mother. And moms who are omniscient, they not only understand this, but they exhibit it on a daily, if not hourly or minutely basis to their children. It's a reflection of the image of God, using God's word and wisdom to teach our children right from wrong, good from bad, how to have manners and to be appropriate and to love others and to relationship with God. That's how we fulfill a vision of this church is to love God and love people. Well, that's what moms do, and, and they teach their children how to love God and love people. It's part of being momniscient. Next is momnipotent. This is strong in the Lord. A mom who is momnipotent, she is acting and reflecting Christ into the world, and she is strong in the Lord. In 17, she dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. Not so she can win a bodybuilding competition, but it's so she can love her children, she can take care of her family, and she's strong. She, uh, strength and dignity are her clothing. Strength is a spiritual strength that comes innately from a relationship with the Lord. Dignity is the way you treat people. It's how you love people. You love God, you love people. 28 says, her children rise up and call her blessed her husband also, and he praises her. Moms who are omnipotent reflect Christ in such a way you just know that they have a relationship with him and they love him. It leaks, it pours out in good times, it pours out in bad times. And one of the ways you can see this is her children 
love her. Her husband loves her. And their lives are better and more connected to God because she exists as their mother. She's omnipotent. And last here in verse 30, it says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. A mother who fears the Lord is omnipotent. She's strong in the Lord, and she should be honored. She should be revered, and she should be praised. Because that's what it is to be a mother. It's to be someone who is reflecting the image of God to your spouse, your children, and to those you love. In the church, it goes beyond just your biological children. It goes to the children who are back in 252. If you are a, a woman who is teaching in our children's program, you are in the role of being a mother, a spiritual guide. A, a, you are the reflection, the Imago Dei of God to our kids. You need to be strong in the Lord. You need to be wise and knowledgeable, and you need to be a loving provider. So they want to continue to come back time and time and time again to spend time with you, to get to know you, but also so you can impact them with the life-changing love, grace, forgiveness, mercy and of Jesus. That's what it means to be a mother, and that's what it means to be uh, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. It's reflecting Christ in all you do in your home. And so we have this charge to mothers. And the mother's charge is simple. And it's really a charge, I believe, it's a charge to all women. Love the toil. Love the work. Delight in it. Know that being a mother is one of the toughest jobs that I will never understand completely. But being a father is it's a fun job for most people, right? You have, you have the dad who's the fun guy and you have the mom who has to deal with all the other stuff. That's a common thing. You see people make jokes on TV, but it, you know, it's real. You know, I get to see a lot of dads and they're the fun guy. They get to go do all this fun stuff and well, mom's at home cooking and cleaning and doing all that stuff. But God sees all of that. God has a plan for your children and love the toil, willingly work at being a mother because you delight and love God and your children. Because when their lives are changed by his word, by his gospel, by the good news, and they enter in relationship with him and they continue to live it out, that's the reward. It's a spiritual reward. It's an eternal reward. And you get to have a lot of fun and laugh and joy in this world. But a mother's role has an eternal benefit for, for all eternity as you get to watch your child come into the kingdom. Next part of the charge is to share wisdom. Get in God's word, gain his wisdom, and share it with your children. It's not enough to just teach your child morals. It's not enough to just teach your child manners. What is more important is teaching your child the wisdom of God's word that will change their heart, that will change their attitude, that will change their behavior, and that will change their eternity. So as a mother, share the wisdom of God with, with your children. As a teacher, as a woman who is uh, Im impacting another generation, share wisdom from God's word. And I think this third one is the most important of all. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Respect God. Honor God. Know that God is in control. Know that God has a plan for you. Know that God has a plan for your children. And, and make that known. Fear the Lord. One of the things that someone uh, told me once is that when I kind of early on my parenting is, uh, and I think it's great advice, even for mothers, get caught by your children fearing the Lord. Get caught by your children reading the Bible. Because the things that we tell our children, sometimes they miss it. And you, you, you as parents, you're going to get this. You may have told your child something a hundred times. Then the really cool neighbor down the street comes down and says the exact same thing that you've said. And your child's like, oh, wow, so-and-so said this. And I think I'm going to do it. And you're like, I've said that a hundred times. Uh, we've all done it. We've been on both sides. But the truth is sometimes uh, you need a different perspective kind of cast in. And one of the ways that you can do that in your own home is not always be saying everything just show it. Get caught by your children reading your Bible and drinking a cup of coffee. Get caught by your children 
being in your room, uh, kneeling on the floor, praying in those private moments and allow your children to, to enter into a different understanding as you as a God-fearing parent and God-fearing mother. That's how you fear the Lord. That's how you connect with your children. And that's how you let them know um, what it means to be loved by God and to love him back. That's what being monumental is. And those times, those moments where you impact your child in that amazing way, when it carries on for their life and for eternity, those are your monuments. That's what you build. That's where your delight comes and that's where your joy. Now for the rest of us, if you're here and you're like, well, I'm not a mom, I'm not a woman, so I'm gonna check out. One thing that you need to know, moms can't be great moms without men who are godly men who support them, love them, encourage them, equip them, honor them, and take care of them. So it doesn't matter if you're a teenager or if you're an adult, we all have a role in, in helping create moms who are monumental. We have, a, we have a role of, if we're teenagers, we gotta honor our moms. We gotta honor the other moms in our church. We gotta encourage them and support them because it's difficult at times. It's frustrating at times. And, and, a, and a word of encouragement um, can go a long way to helping you get through another day, another week, another month. So we all have a job to play. We need to come around each other and support each other in such a way that we can build into each other, but build into the future. Because really, truly, the future is not down there. That's our present. Those children here, that's the present of the church. That's the present generation. It's not the future generation. They are growing. They are learning. Some of them have a grasp of the gospel that would surprise many of you sitting here because they, they get it, that childlike faith, their understanding, and they're just, they're just delving into it. So they're our present. The future is yet to come. And so we need to continue to prepare the present by loving our moms, equipping them, and allowing them to be monumental. And as we kind of close today, and our worship team's gonna come up, as we pray, I wanna just do this. If you're here this morning and, um, and your mom's here, just find her, whether you're young, whether you're older. Find your mom, just get next to her. Give her, give her a hug, give her a squeeze in the arm, hold her hand. We're gonna just sing in a moment. We're gonna pray together. And I'd like you to kind of do that while we pray. If you're sitting next to someone, you know they're a mom, their children aren't here, just, just tell them, just kind of go over and connect them and say, I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so glad that you're a mother. And it doesn't matter how old or young, but we need to be the church. We need to love God, but we need to love each other. That's loving people. And so this morning as we celebrate moms, we need to celebrate each other. We need to hold each other up. We need to value each other and in a powerful way so that we know that our monuments are here and are, we're building and we're building another generation to know God's love and to fear the Lord. So let's pray. And as we, get, as we sing, uh, feel free to move around the worship center Find a mom, and let's make sure we don't let any mother leave this morning not, without knowing that they're loved, they're valued, they're appreciated, and that you're so thankful about what they're doing to build into a generation or to celebrate them that they've already raised their children and, that, and encourage them to continue to do so for all of our children that come as part of our family here at Heart of the Lakes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just love you. Lord, we, we are so thankful for what, how Scripture shows us what it means to be a woman who fears the Lord, a mother who fears the Lord, who, who often just has a thankless job, but one of the most important jobs that one could ever have, to love children into relationship with you, to teach them, to guide them, to support them, to encourage them. Lord, I thank you for my mother. I thank you for my grandmothers who, who have made an impact on my life. I thank you that they do that because they had generations of mothers and grandmothers doing the same for them. Lord, I pray as a church, we can be charged with uh, supporting our mothers, supporting our women, and allowing them to uh, just be monumental at home, at work, at church, and beyond. We thank you, Lord. We pray you bless them in an amazing way. Allow them to leave this, this morning refreshed and recharged to toil 
diligently, to toil willingly, and to delight in the work of being a mother. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. While we sing, if you'll take some time, just get up, find a mother, let them know that you love them, you're thankful for them, and that you want to be an encouragement to them this morning. Well, go this week knowing that you are loved, loved with a, an everlasting love, a love that's deeper than the seas. And enjoy this Mother's Day. Have a great week. See you next week.